in this episode of Suspect Zero, the murder mystery of Jeanette De Palma. Welcome to Suspect Zero, where we not only discuss unsolved cold cases, but serial killers whose crimes are lesser known or virtually unknown, yet the most terrifying. I'm Dawn Washburn, and joining me is my co-host, Dr. Michael Arntfield. Hello, Michael. Hey, Dawn. How's it going? It's going well. Um, this case, I cannot wait to get into this case. Yeah, this is a strange one, a disturbing one, and uh, lots to unpack in terms of not just the case, but the context behind the case. And again, in keeping with our our branding, pretty sure none of our viewers or listeners will have heard of this one before now. Yeah, it's, you know, there's been some things and we'll talk about, we'll get into, you know, what's been publicized about it and what hasn't, but it's, it's, it's pretty old now and kind of forgotten. So revisiting it is going to be a really good thing. Um, so let me give the background. You know how I always give my little blurb. I have to gather all my thoughts. And sometimes I do this for my students too, just to give the background and then we'll get into the convo. So it's August 7th, 1972 in the seemingly quiet suburb of Springfield, New Jersey. The community describes the town as an ideal place to raise a family and enjoy the various stores and restaurants that many frequent. So you can imagine how shocking it was to learn of a family's quest to locate their missing daughter. There was a thickness in the air. The community was now driven by fear and suspicion. Where is this missing girl? How could this happen in their community? Families come here for a better life. The De Palma family moved to Springfield with the understanding that this would be a great place to live. Their faith was rooted in Christianity and in the 70s, this was more than acceptable as the talk of Jesus was common dialogue, especially among Springfield residents. The De Palmas could never predict that their lives in Springfield would ever feel the evil that their faith warned them against. It's four days after her 16th birthday and Jeanette De Palma, kind of a wild child who was exploring her own identity, was last seen by her mother as she left her home on that Monday, August 7th. She told her mother she was going to take a train to her friend's house in Berkeley Heights, but Jeanette never arrived and did not return home that evening. Her parents very quickly knew that something wasn't right. So they filed a missing persons report with the Springfield Police Department where they pursued some insignificant leads at the time. It wasn't until six weeks later when a woman and her dog were walking near the food dye quarry when the dog ran off and brought back a human arm. The woman called the police who then started scouring the area for what happened. On a cliff in the quarry, coined the devil's teeth, a decomposed body of a young woman was discovered. Her body was lying face down with her left arm tucked under her head and the right arm missing, which suggested the arm came from this young girl. She was strangled to her death and strange things surrounding her body didn't help to dispel rumors of witchcraft or cults. Varying opinions about how her body was surrounded fuels the media frenzy and feeds into the sat satanic panic theories. One officer saw logs laid out in what looked like a makeshift coffin, which appeared to look ritualistic. Eventually, the girl's body would be identified as Jeanette. So, Michael, a lot of information on this one. I was trying to get out, you know, the, the basic foundation of what's going on, but there's so much more to discuss. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that on Friday night, my husband's from Central Jersey. So he gave me sort of a tour of the area and we checked out. I mean, I ran her route. I, I you know, so we'll talk about that. But give me your thoughts before we we kind of get into this. Well, you mentioned it. it's the context here is, is key. So we have a variety of items surrounding the victim uh, that at the time are interpreted as having some ritualistic um, or pagan purpose. And this is at the height of, you called it the satanic panic, which uh, I can talk more about later, but actually began with a book published in Canada called Michelle Remembers that's sort of never been corroborated, but are the recovered memories of a woman named Michelle Smith who co-wrote the book uh, written by her psychiatrist whereby she recalled being the victim of uh, satanic ritual abuse and the book actually coined the term ritual abuse. So this is the first sort of revelation that these types of secret societies targeting teens and children may be out there and it was taken at face value and spread like wildfire. And for the next 10 years, uh, that's all, I mean, any crime, uh, murder in particular, um, that lacked uh, an otherwise obvious motive was sort of deemed to be 
satanic or ritualistic until proven otherwise. So it, in this case, we have to wonder, uh, was this seen through the lens, particularly, as you said, in a, in a, in a God-fearing Christian community, was this seen through the lens of the occult from the beginning when there might be another explanation for, for these items? Uh, were people seeing what, what wasn't really there or, or, or were uh, coincidences chalked up to being this, some form of ritual? And I mean, it's not particularly helpful that then the file gets destroyed, which just adds to the, the deeper conspiracy that people have been talking about. Like that, like that maybe some cops were part of this cult and made sure that the file never went beyond, you know, a small group of investigators before it was destroyed. Now, speaking about the crime scene. So when would you drive through this, the actual reservoir itself, I took some pictures and I was, it was pretty shocking to see the way that the, um, that the trees fall and literally all over the place were, if, if you really wanted to look at it through the lens of witchcraft, it looked like there were coffins all over the place because the way the trees fell, the, the logs would look like coffins everywhere. I mean, I can't even, I couldn't count them if I, if I wanted to. So it, it kind of made me think, you know, the way that the way her body was laying and the fact that her arm was laying over one of the logs made me took a sec, maybe just kind of second guess it, that if the body was thrown there, it would have been thrown over the log. If you were trying to make a coffin, it would have been around the body and wouldn't have been touching the arm at all, it would seem. You know, um, a few things just really about this case just started jumping into my brain. Even as I was, I was doing her route, from her house to where she was supposed to be at the train station, which this is a lengthy walk from her home to where the train station was. Um, she was hitchhiking and I don't think she really wanted to tell her parents that that's what she was really doing because I think they would have said something against it. So there's a lot of misconceptions about the timing and where she was. And also we can get into this because I know you're gonna have something to say about this, but what was surrounding the body um, her purse was emptied out and her purse was, wasn't there. And also her cross necklace was all, was missing from the scene. Um, around the body though, laid these things that were in her purse, like a Vix inhaler and her eyeshadow and, um, a little vial that they tested later, which, which was lead. Um, and then I looked that up and I was looking into some witchcraft things where they use a lot of metals and lead was something to like, you know, to rejuvenate the soul or to eradicate any sort of thing. Like if you were involved in drugs, it would help you recover from that. But her mother said she wasn't even using drugs, maybe pills and a little marijuana, but nothing that was severe. I think it was the sister who had gone into rehab at the time. So or gone into a church to help her get out of it. So I don't know, just things are, about this just look a little shady to me. And, and not only that, but also some deaths after Jeanette, which followed a kind of a pattern. So I don't know if I'm buying this. I don't know if I'm buying this, the, the ritual and the witchcraft thing. I don't, I don't think I'm buying it. But when you're also, I wanted to point this out, when you're in the area, when you're standing at the, there's like a the fence is kind of pulled down. So people who I guess want to, because after you find out about the case, I guess the fence went up later, I'm assuming. But you can jump over the fence because it's kind of pulled down, I guess, by the locals. And maybe they can check things out. Um, but when the fence is down, there's flat land. And then you're facing a very, very, very steep hill, which is her body was found at the top of the hill. I mean, it's almost like a mudslide. So I don't know, to carry a body doesn't seem logical, but to maybe go up there with her would seem a little bit more logical than carrying it up there. Um, I'm not saying it's it's beyond somebody to, to do that, but it, it just seems like that's a lot of trouble when there's so many vast lands there, you could just dump it and be fine. So what's your take on that? Because I have a lot to say. <laughs> well, a lot of people are hung up on the location. And when you talk about rituals, I mean, films like, the Wicker Man and Midsummer come to mind in terms of these these cult communities that um, you know certain geological structures hold or, or locations obviously are of significance and, and they believe in uh, you know some pagan entity uh, that they're making these these sacrifices to for one reason or another. Um, 
But you mentioned, let's go back first to, I'll, I'll come back to that because I, I think you're right that people zeroing in on this being a ritualistic murder may have obfuscated or at least um, thrown them off track for subsequent murders. We may be dealing with a serial killer, whereas, and this is part of the set, whereas authorities and the public thought, you know, this is an outlier because of it's the the formation is called the devil's teeth there was a lot of significance put on that oh that's right. this has to have because of the name some Too ritual much. purpose and and therefore satanic well there's a lot of things in the, you know devil's cliff devil's teeth devil's gorge it, 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 yeah it has nothing to do with uh you know the the church of satan um items from her purse strewn around her so this Again, were they strewn or were they deliberately placed for some purpose? Uh, the BBC series Luther, starring Idris Elba, which is a, a great and very accurate police procedural. Actually, uh, the first uh, season, what they call series, depicts a serial killer, uh, fake cab driver, who uh, becomes known as the handbag killer because he has a very fetishistic obsession with the contents of a woman's handbag and he strangles his victims much like in this case and then places again these personal items driver's licenses uh inhalers car keys uh cell phone around the body and it really has more of a a visual and, and paraphilic and sexual uh purpose it has nothing to do with ritual per se his personal ritual maybe but not ritual in, in terms of this being uh you know in, in in service to some entity real or perceived so again all this information is lost so i would be very curious to see those photos and and, and because there are uh, pretty good examples that we can draw on in terms of were these strewn about and just discarded or were these placed with some degree of, of deliberation and fantasy? So uh, we'll never know. But the fact that the purse was emptied, that jewelry was taken from the body, again, uh, probably a souvenir. That's not something that you would rob someone for or that you would get a lot of money for at a, at a pawn shop. So that tells me that the taking of the necklace, which is among the you know, more intuitive and, and recurringly preferred souvenirs taken by, by by killers, sex murderers, would make sense. And we should draw a distinction there too. Uh, garments, personal possessions, jewelry taken to relive the crime uh, taken by a killer who's a collector, whether it be a serial killer or a one-time killer. Uh, those inanimate objects are souvenirs, um, trophies, are things that uh, consist of living tissue. So taking a lock of hair, cutting out, we've seen, for instance, the, the rest stop killer in Nashville being just one of them, cutting out uh, flesh that has a tattoo that can be preserved and the tattoo can be looked at. So that's a trophy. In this case, we see souvenirs taken that, that suggests to me um, less ritual. So ritual murders are a recognized subtype of, of homicide, obviously, very rare. Uh, but this suggests more to me uh, a sexual murder, uh, which would then suggest it belongs as part of the series of the other murders that follow later. I, I completely agree. Um, you know, we have this big case. You've heard of the Richard Cottingham case in New Jersey that's been going on. Um, you know, he's in jail, but he's been slowly releasing names of victims that he had killed. So the ones that he has already released, I read so thoroughly on them. You know, um, so when I read about what he did to the victims, you know, he doesn't have, he has certain things that he does, but he also, like you said in our last podcast, that he does scatter a little bit. He doesn't always stick to a specific way that he does it. So I started, I took that in because remember, like everything we talk about, like I learned just as much as our students and our listeners do. So when you said that, I started looking for those patterns. And when I started looking at it, there was one case, um, a girl from Bogota, New Jersey, that, that, Cottingham had had strangled to death again same situation very similar to Jeanette and also strangled her with her with her own cross necklace um so it, it just certain things started to the I don't know look very similar to me in the sense that he was in Jersey he was he was familiar with Jersey he I'm not saying he was the only serial killer in Jersey but it sort of follows things that he would do picking up the hitchhiking women um 
very early on, probably like 69 to 70 area, he would pick, pick up the hitchhikers more than he would pick up the prostitutes. The prostitutes came later. Maybe, maybe he figured, and the girls that he would pick up were similar. They were blonde. Some of them were brunette, but it's, the, it's a very similar type situation. They do have a couple of, um, a couple of things that they went with at the time. There was a mentally uh, challenged person who ended up having schizophrenia, who left his family in the, in the area. He was an accountant. Um, and he was actually, uh, you know, he, he was actually accused of the murder of one of the girls and then acquitted for it later. Um, and he actually went into some sort of mental institution for, for what he had done. But I just found it just interesting to keep looking at some of these things. And actually, I think the, his name was, um, it, it always escapes me when I think of names, Otto Nilsson. Um, he was somebody that they were looking at because he, had, he was seen picking up one of the hitchhiking girls by a witness. But then something else happened during this hitchhiking theory as my husband and I were driving through the town. I said, you know, it's really strange how this one particular witness said that she was about 19 at the time. And she said that she had picked up a girl in Springfield and the girl had asked her to bring her to Berkeley Heights. And the woman said, well, I'll bring you to Berkeley Heights, but I can only go as far as my apartments will go. And she said, well, that's fine. I'm meeting some friends over at, you know, at, at the traffic light. So this woman goes on to explain that as the girl was in the car with her. She's fiddling with her purse strap and her cross necklace. And I just found that an interesting thing to say. Um, because I, I don't know, there's, there's something innately inside me that tells me she never got to Berkeley Heights or that she was partying somewhere and then tried to get back, but something happened. I, I, there's no account of these friends saying she made it there. So then the hitchhiking and the woman who picked her up wouldn't make sense because no one saw her in Berkeley Heights. So I don't know, just these strange things. If that's even the same individual that was picked up. Exactly, I, exactly. I mean, a, a lot of young girls would have had cross necklaces in that community at the time. And hitchhiking, of and course, is uh, very common. I mean, it's interesting to see, I had someone from, in a, in a media interview the other day, asked me about, uh, you know, the decline of hitchhiking and is there a corresponding decline maybe in, in serial killers? And well, we know there there hasn't been. Oh. Um, I mean, we still don't know how many there are and we can talk about that in another episode in, in terms of just the data is all over the place and, and a lot of cases get misclassified. And, and I mean, the FBI has always said, well, we estimate that only 1% of homicides is the work of, of a serial killer. And we now know that's that's not, that's not the, the case. case. And, and they've been relying on data that was incomplete. So maybe 1% of the only 70% of actual murders that they were tabulating. So when you add in the other 30%, well, now it goes up. And in fact, uh, we think it's probably closer to 8 to 10%. Um, and again, we'll talk more about that. That's a lot of math to talk about that is beyond the, the scope of this episode. Yeah, that's not going to be my forte. So you're going to need to talk <laughs> about that part in much more in depth. Um, but yeah, but even just if you look at it through a logical lens, yeah. If you look even on the because I tell my students this, when you go to the murderpedia.org website, you just click on you just want to look at just I'll just say you want to look at Bundy and you just click B. The amount of the amount of murderers that come up under B, there's right. no way those statistics could be correct. There's just no way. You know, just based on that alone. On the afternoon of Monday, August 7th, 1972, 16-year-old Jeanette De Palma left her home on Clearview Road in Springfield Township, New Jersey, telling her mother that she was going to take a train to a friend's house. When she did not arrive at her friend's home or return later that evening, her parents filed a missing persons report with the Springfield Police Department the following day. Six weeks later, on September 19th, De Palma's remains were found atop a cliff inside the Springfield's Who Die Quarry. This occurred after a local dog brought her decomposing right forearm and hand back to its owner. Later, some Springfield residents claimed that De Palma's remains were actually found lying on a pentagram surrounded by mutilated animal remains. Law enforcement authorities have denied that this was true. Further controversy was aroused when it was discovered that the body had been found on a cliff known to locals for several decades as the Devil's Teeth. So in 1929, the FBI developed what's called the Uniform Crime Reporting System, which was a standardized checklist that all police departments investigating murders needed to submit or supposed to submit 
to the Justice Department so that annual sort of uh, averages in terms of number of homicides could be tabulated, trends could be identified. And uh, we know that, you know, there was limited compliance with that. And that's what we do at the Murder Accountability Project is go around and find departments that have not been submitting. So when we add it all up, number one, there's been way more murders than were ever tabulated. There's been way more unidentified serial killers than have ever been considered. Uh, but we see that uh, even with the raw data that the FBI collected in 2016, that was that year marked the lowest solved rate since this program was implemented in 1929. So even with all the new technologies and, and advancements in terms of case management and standardized ways of investigating homicides, uh, there's fewer cases solved or were in 2016. It's improved a little bit, but that's like at just over 50%. So that's one in two killers left to, left to kill again and who no one's even looking for. So, uh, so we're not talking about suspects identified who are wanted and just not arrested. So the case remains open. We're talking about suspects never identified. So um, to think that these are just all one-offs, that they stopped after that, there's, there's no way. So we don't actually know the number of serial killers we're dealing with, which is why cases like Cottingham that you mentioned I mean, these are lesser known offenders whose the full scale of their crimes comes to light years later. And I think, and this is part of the reason we selected this case is this is currently in the news. He is currently in the news. These, these cases sort of like Sam Little that are being revealed after the fact. Uh, and here we have a lesser known case, Jeanette De Palma, that maybe the two have something in common. So, and over the years, it's been relegated to being, you know, a ritualistic satanic crime. Well, maybe we can have a more grown up conversation now about what we know about the prevalence of those murders. murders. And there's, by the way, not a single corroborated uh, case of a satanic ritual murder in the United States, despite this massive panic. I mean, there was a number of prosecutions initiated in ritual uh, abuse uh, that really never went anywhere or, or convictions were overturned. Uh, but it was really sort of a fanciful f conspiracy theory that, that that now shows up again in various versions like QAnon and uh, Pizzagate. I mean, these are really just refurbished tales and conspiracy theories that are, that unfortunately derailed a lot of investigations that were taken seriously in the in the seventies and particularly in the eighties after this this book was published that right. you know started this firestorm. So um, the only case. I can think of, it's not necessarily satanic, not solved. And it's detailed in Roy Hazelwood's book, Dark Dreams. Roy Hazelwood, I've mentioned him before on the show. Uh, it was one of the lesser known, but I mean, very respected of the early profilers with the FBI specializing in, in sex crimes. And he had a twisted case and it's mentioned in the book. No, no particulars are given, but uh, he was brought in by a local police department looking for answers. Um, a young girl is working at a convenience store at night. This is pre-security cameras, pre all the workplace safety you know, measures that you would expect now. And a state trooper goes in to buy, you know, uh, on the night shift to buy a pop or get a coffee or whatever. And there's no one at the, there's no one at the counter. So she's been taken from the store uh, and is found like weeks later in a field near some discarded pornography uh, attached to a medieval breaking wheel, which is a torture device used in the Middle Ages, oh where basically God. you're you're splayed into sort of a, a figure eight against this wheel and your limbs are smashed against the, 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 the spokes of this wheel. So she's tortured to death in a ritualistic fashion using medieval implements in, in a wooded area and uh, never solved. And... Uh, so that is the most sort of Wiccan-esque ritualistic uh, murder I can think of in, in an outdoor setting with a, a, a stranger who's been um, sort of kidnapped. But uh, obvious differences from this case. But, uh, but again, just to show you the rarity of these cases, okay. whereas at the time, including Jeanette's case, uh, if there's no other obvious explanation, there's weird stuff at the crime scene and it's outdoors or especially in the woods or at an, on an elevated geological formation must be ritual. So that's unfortunately. There was also, you know, the, the investigators didn't agree 
So there was one one cop who believed that what he saw was ritualistic and then another one who really didn't feel that anything like that was there. So again, when you're when you're surveying a crime scene, I guess that's a matter of perspective and opinion too. I mean, everything is very subjective unless something's really, you know, tangible, something that's there that you can really grab onto. So I think the, the questions become, you know, how ritualistic is it based on a pit on opinion? Right. And this, of course, predates just by a few years, really the the maturation of, of the FBI's behavioral uh, science unit or behavioral analysis unit has gone through a couple of iterations. But I mean, that really sort of came of age 77 through 80. And I mean, had this murder occurred a few years later, of course, they could have been brought in to consult, look at the photographs and, and render probably a, a more... Um, you know, reasonable, certainly more impartial, being from outside the community, having other cases nationally to compare to, uh, render a different opinion. So as you said, it's a subjective interpretation of the evidence based on the experience of the, the local detectives who, again, are living in sort of an echo chamber of, uh, you know, hyper-Christianity uh, and therefore intrusions like this, especially if there's interpretive or otherwise, uh, any type of ritual element therefore must be the work of you know, devil worship. This is a black mass incident. Well, again, uh, there's not a single corroborated case of a black mass, uh, which is a satanic version of, of mass, uh, often involving some kind of desecration or, or you know, torture or murder in theory. It's not a single corroborated case of this occurring involving a large group of people. Again, there's weird exceptions like that case I told you about with the medieval torture device. Right. But again, was that satanic? We may never know. It probably, obviously this person's a sadist uh, and whether even the pornography discarded nearby was theirs or not, um, who knows? But again, these types of um, what we call known vice areas. So places so this was Hazelwood's theory in that case, and it may be the case in, in, in Jeanette's murder as I well. I think it is. I think that, I know what you're going to say. That. that other people are using and know this place for illicit purposes, whether it be to, to go and get high exactly. or to take uh, someone for a tryst, uh, to take a sex trade worker. These places are known uh, to illegally dump things, even something as benign as that. All these people are drawn, to, word gets around that this is the place to go, especially if it's got a, a name like the Devil's Teeth. Yeah. Like the, it'll be a bush bash place for kids to drink beer one week, a place to dump an old refrigerator the next week, and a place, unfortunately, um, to dump a body the week after that. My husband said, he said, this is a very, we, we used to hang out there. He's like, we would, everybody would just go, they would drink, everybody, you know, they would do what they needed to do. And they, he said, you know, you just look up at the stars and then you, you could see these people really late at night, just walking across the fields into the woods. And you're like, where are they going? Yeah. You know, he said it was creepy, but he's like, it was just known. It was known behavior. He's like, and then at some point we were told like, don't, you know, stay away from those woods. It's satanic. And then they have that deserted village that's in there, which we tried to get in, but it was, uh, it was shut down. But, uh, like you couldn't get through it, but it, this this Watchung Reservoir seems to be the place and the grounds where people would perform these rituals. Now, when you talk to the witches, <laughs> the, the the people practicing witchery are like, that's not how we do it. That's not what no. we do. So you know, to cause that panic and to and to cause that sort of fear in the community, you could see why they would go straight to blame that, like you said, to kind of put the kibosh on going there. And, and kids hanging out because immediately everyone's like, don't go there. Don't go, don't go anymore. You know, they performed a ritual. This girl was, but really they never really looked into, into what was going on. And then when the rest of these girls started going missing, hitchhike, same type of situation throughout Jersey, it, it was just, you can't, you can't ignore that. You just, you can't ignore no. it. And, and I, you know, knowing what we know now, I mean, now you look at it and it, the case should be re-looked at because that's just, it's not how it went down. I think what's happening now is the weird New Jersey, did you hear the weird New Jersey um, magazine? So we have a, a magazine in, in Jersey, it's called Weird New Jersey. And basically it's a magazine that points out urban legends. So when you read the certain things in the urban legends, everybody drives there like, oh, let's go see the ghosts of whoever, you know, walking through the street. 
And that's how they, you know, that's what they do. So when Weird New Jersey posted the Wachung Reservoir, this story kind of unfolded, I believe, from that. And then the authors start, wrote the book on the devil's teeth and went to the site to go see where she, you know, and they even said, doesn't, doesn't really look too ritualistic. I mean, you know, so, and there's a lot of theories unfolding from that, but I keep coming back. My gut is telling me this is the work of a serial killer. My gut is telling me. You know, and then the other case, there was a necklace missing and a jacket. Here, there's a purse and and a necklace. It just it just seems a little bit too coincidental for me, anyway. Jeanette's case, you're right, has presumptively compelling linkages to other unsolved cases that are reasonably close in time and space. Needs and needs to be deemed part of that set until proven otherwise or excluded totally. uh, and, wh- and whether that's Cottingham's work or somebody else who still hasn't been identified. Uh, this is, and this is in part why we do this show, here's an example of a public panic and a narrative being attached to a murder uh, that essentially ensured it would never get solved because as soon as you go down that rabbit hole of uh, this is a coven of witches or this is a secret society of, you know, highly placed people who are actually secret Satanists, uh, uh, who who did this, and this is a human sacrifice. You cannot unring a bell like that, and it becomes impossible to disabuse people or dissuade people from clinging to that theory. And uh, now, again, I'd, I'm hopeful that this wouldn't happen today. Uh, but again, the number of people who bought into to Pizzagate, uh, or it's media. Anyone. It's media. It's just right. you know people just hear what they want to hear, and they and they they love a good story. I say this all the time. They love the narrative. They love the good story. If you're feeding them a good story from the right angle, you could sell them really anything. You know, and I, we're included. I mean, as soon as the news breaks out, you're like, oh my god! But you have to kind of explicate. You have to like unpack it. Think about yeah. what's going on. And now I've I, I've honed in on that skill a lot more. But that's, and I think when, with this case, you know, when I started reading and I'm like, I don't really know how publicized this is and, but it hasn't really been touched on in in a few years. And I think this just needs to be re-looked at, you know, and I even think the person they think it is, I don't, something's not tying in for me, you know, even, even the paranoid schizophrenic angle, he was seen picking up one of the girls hitchhiking or the witness thought, you know, it looked like this particular person. So he was tried and, um, but he was a paranoid schizophrenic. I, I, something about that tells me that he would be a little more erratic in, in what he does. I mean, it could be the way I look at it, but that he would not be in control of, and this seems to be a little bit more organized. It has organized elements for sure. Uh, we have, um, again, we're not sure what the primary crime scene is. That, that would really tell us everything. I, I, I've, an offender who moves a body between crime scenes. So there's a primary crime scene. The body is 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 transported and concealed at a secondary crime scene where either there's a, you know deliberate desecration or indignity rendered to the body, or, or it's even just dumped there. It, even if beyond dis, you know disposing of a body improperly, there's no other offenses committed on the body. It's still a cr- second crime scene. There is really accurate data on the types of demographic common characteristics among sexual murderers who do that and they're overwhelmingly sexual murderers so we know they're overwhelmingly employed they're overwhelmingly uh owners of of vehicles and that's how they're able to or at least have private access to a vehicle uh which allows them to put a body in the trunk and then find a place to go this we know that they've been to the secondary crime scene before again this was a place people went to to drink beer or to it was a lover's lane sort of you could do all kinds of stuff there he will have been there for some comparatively minor maybe still a legal reason before we know that they're overwhelmingly in relationships which is why they have to dispose of them in these outdoor locations rather than bring them home so uh and we know there are overwhelmingly males between a certain uh, age range and overwhelmingly Caucasian. So right there, you've got enough information going on the balance of probabilities of previous cases where this disposal pathway, as we call it, has been seen. You can really prune down uh, a potential pool of local suspects just ba- relying on that data. And again, that's all information collected by the FBI and used for profiling purposes. Profiling is not some 
you know, again, to, to draw in this case, it's not sorcery, it's not guesswork. They're looking at what has happened before in the overwhelming number of cases. What are the common characteristics among offenders who exhibit certain modus operandi or who have certain signatures and certain motivations? And can we use those overwhelming commonalities to then suggest on a balance of probabilities, this offender probably has similar things in common. And if nothing else, it provides a good starting point about the types of people to prioritize as persons of interest. And that obviously has not been done ever in this case, as far as we can tell. And the file's been lost. What was it, a fire or a flood? Well, here's what happened. So when when the the um, the authors of the On the Devil's Teeth book, the weird New Jersey um, magazine um, guys came to the scene and they started writing their book and their findings. They said that the police told them there was a flood, but the evidence was never really destroyed in the flood and that they were able to get their hands on a lot of from a lot of things from Jeanette's case. And also there's another there's another resident who who was fighting for the DNA on Jeanette's clothing to be tested. Now, this is a weird thing. So this particular person has no ties to the family, except that he was a friend of someone in the family. And he really said, like, you know, I'm going to solve this for you. I'm going to help you. So he made this promise to a person who pa has since passed away. So because of that, he went on this quest to make sure that Jeanette's clothing was tested. He went to court and fought and the, the court denied him, said the family really should be or the police should be asking. That's really not you. Um, and the family is really not happy with this person. It, which is a strange thing. And he keeps saying, why don't you want this tested? It doesn't make any sense that you wouldn't want this tested. And, you know, the response from the family is, you know, your agenda is 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 something other than our agenda. So I don't know what the, the what's going on there. Um, it's pretty sad. Like everybody should kind of really come together for the same purpose of wanting that, you know, her parents, I think are deceased now. So I don't think they really have a hand in asking, but it's like the children of the children and the cousins and everybody's kind of involved. Um, but yeah, they turned him down for this, for the court said no. And, you know, the family's asking for the belongings back. Apparently someone has her diary, someone has, you know, and the family saying we want her stuff back. So I, the flood theory, and then we come to what people have now deemed a police cover up and why didn't they want this done? Maybe a son of one of the police officers was involved and, and that's why, you know, they don't want to let this stuff go. There's so many theories on this particular case, but even if I look at it from a friend, okay, somebody who really was obsessed with her, because there's a there's a person of interest in that area, but e even if he was obsessed with her at the time, it just see, to me it just doesn't seem the work of a of a of a, a kid who liked her. Still comes back to me that the trophies taken. I don't think a kid at 16 or even 18 would think about taking trophies to make it look like it was a serial kiss. You know, I don't know. So to me, I just keep coming back to that every single time. So, you know, again, I'm no investigator, <laughs> but just my hunch is that it just has to do with the series of other things that have taken place after her murder. So in terms of, yeah, the flood or missing items, uh, external litigants trying to get items tested that the police, for whatever reason, have no interest in, in testing. I mean, first of all, files from this period often existed in various states of completeness. It's not like today there would be, uh, you know, a digital case management uh, software that would consolidate and tab everything digitally and it could all just be, be found. There'll be photos and you know a portion of what we call the murder book or, or the chronology in one detective's possession maybe he took it home and never brought it back there'll be uh you know crime scene photos uh and maybe some exhibits in evidence control some exhibits after a while especially back then become biohazards need to be disposed of and you rely then on the secondary uh photographs that's the best evidence so facsimiles of the original item so it's it's a dog's breakfast in terms of uh, being able to track down every item of evidence and, and finding a holistic, complete file. So there may have been a flood that destroyed part of it. There would be some remnants that other people could get their hands on, including it sounds like clothing and, and this diary. Um, but I mean, this is this is what you deal with when you look at cases from this vintage. And in my upcoming book, How to Solve a Cold Case, 
you know, the, the secrets that the offenders and even in some cases the police don't want you to know. Uh, there is no overcoming, unfortunately, the human condition when also dealing with these cases. So you mentioned infighting between this outsider who the family sees as intruding. The parents aren't around any longer. The descendants have different motives, it sounds like. You've got people writing books. You've got police who, original investigators long since gone as well. Uh, and you can't predict how people react to uh, the sort of ups and downs of the case, good news, bad news. I mean, you're these are not cases that exist uh, sort of in a, in a sterile uh petri dish you're always going to have to manage often difficult personalities that just cause trouble and muddy the waters and this is really not talked about a lot is is that x factor that human factor that keeps these cases cold and unfortunately screws them up and that's not just the investigators but people on the margins who are just making noise or introducing unnecessary distractions and here we are you know, two generations later, and we're no further ahead. No, we aren't. No, not at all. Um, I'm really, I'm hoping something comes out of this case. I would love to do a part two on this case if anything came out and, and you know, just, it would, it would just be something of interest to me, especially because going there just to feel that victim. And if she was alive walking through there, Right. It's creepy. It's creepy. I'm not going to, it's creepy. I mean, I don't know if it's because we know what happened that it's making it creepy. Um, but it's just a creepy feeling, you know? Um, but okay, Michael. So I guess we could wrap it up here. A uh, lot of, lot of information again, as usual. <laughs> so see you guys next time on suspect zero. In the next episode of suspect zero, the case of the millennium strangler. Thank you.